The scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of the Gospel of Luke. I will read chapter 6, verses, verses 27 through 38, which you can find on page 64 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. Listen now to the words preached by Jesus in his Sermon on the Plain. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not even withhold your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do for you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much gain. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Startle us, almighty God. Stun us into silence that we may encounter your word, your will, and your way. In wonderment we pray. Amen. The book of Genesis is the story of how a particular family called by God became the nation of Israel. Leave behind all that is familiar to you and go to the land that I will show you, God commanded. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham and Sarah were the first to receive this call. We know from the way the story goes that Abraham was radically faithful. Without questioning, Abraham believed and obeyed the call from God. As Abraham's grandson, Jacob inherited this call from God. Compared to his grandfather, however, Jacob was motivated by self-interest as much as, if not more than, by a desire to be faithful to God. As the meaning of his name indicates, Jacob was a trickster, downright deceptive. Faithfulness to God was a struggle for Jacob. By the time we come to Jacob's son, Joseph, God's call has become so faint, almost forgotten, that we wonder if it's even relevant. No longer is there any wrestling whatsoever with God. Through his life, though his life consists of dramatic ups and downs, Joseph seems unaware of God's presence in his life. The story of Joseph runs from chapter 37 to chapter 50, which ends the book of Genesis. In the span of these many chapters, Joseph begins his life as a shepherd boy of a nomadic family and ends up becoming viceroy over Egypt. 
Let's briefly review the dramatic sequence of events that make up the story of Joseph. Though he was born the youngest of many brothers, Joseph was held in favor by his father. Rather than being sent to work alongside his brothers, Joseph was left to spend his time daydreaming. Even in his dreams, Joseph saw himself reigning over his brothers while his brothers bowed down before him. Jealous because their father favored him and fed up by the privilege shown to him, Joseph's brothers initially plotted to kill him. On second thought, they decided it would be more profitable for them to sell him into slavery. But before they were able to carry out the plan, a group of traveling Midianites happened to come upon him first, and with the same idea in mind, they trafficked Joseph with them in order to sell him into slavery. One unfortunate episode led to another. And Joseph found himself not only displaced far from home in Egypt, but even thrown into prison, though innocent of the charges that put him there. While in prison, Joseph had a hand in helping a fellow inmate to get released. This man happened to be the former chief steward of Pharaoh. Upon the chief steward's release from prison, Joseph bid him, but remember me when it is well with you. Please do me the kindness to make mention of me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this place. For, it, for in fact, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon. But the man forgot about Joseph until two years later, when something happened to prompt the steward's memory. Pharaoh had a dream that required interpretation. It was only then that the steward remembered Joseph as the man who could interpret dreams. So while still in prison, Joseph was asked to interpret Pharaoh's dream, and Joseph obliged, interpreting a forecast of seven years of plenty to be followed by seven years of scarcity. Joseph proposed a solution that would save Egypt from ruin in the years of famine. As a result, Joseph was propelled from prisoner to prime minister, and years later, Joseph's brothers made their way to Egypt, seeking salvation from the drought that had ruined all the land. In an ironic twist of events, their salvation was now in the hands of the brother that they had sought to destroy years ago. Through all these ups and downs, twists and turns of his life, not once do we find Joseph attributing to God any activity in, over, or through his life. Not once, that is until we come to chapter 45. Our lectionary reading this morning marks the turning point in Joseph's outlook over his life, revealing his identity to his brothers who thought him dead and likely have been feeling guilty all these years. Joseph says, come closer to me. I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God, God has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. In this short speech, three times, Joseph credits God with what has happened. God sent me to preserve life. God sent me before you. It was not you who sent me, but God. Whereas in all the preceding episodes of his life, Joseph never once mentioned God, in this moment, 
Joseph seems to have recognized that things turned out as they did, not because he or anyone else intended them, certainly not his brothers, nor the chief steward, nor the all-powerful Pharaoh, but rather because God intended them. Do not be afraid, Joseph says to his family, even though you intended to do me harm, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as God is doing today. The disclosure of how all things fit together is stunning. It stuns everyone involved, including Joseph. Joseph and his family now recognize how their past sins relate to their present salvation, how the salvation of an empire relates to the salvation of their family. And it is all the more, it is all more than they could ever have imagined possible, much more than they could have planned for themselves. There are stories like this, stories that are so stunning and amazing that while some may speak of them as coincidences, they are providential. But the difference between a coincidence and providence, I think, doesn't have to do with the degree of amazingness. It seems to me that the difference between coincidence and providence is the presence of forgiveness. Could it be that when forgiveness is present, God's providence is possible? For forgiveness is what enables the possibility for a new future to arise out of conditions that seem to perpetuate cycles of violence or lead to a dead end. You can imagine the terrible fear that Joseph's brothers must have felt when they discovered that the brother against whom they had plotted murder still lived and now held the power either to save or destroy them in his hands. They must have feared his anger and revenge. Joseph would have had all the right to react to his past in the ways they expected, but Joseph does not retaliate. He breaks away from the past. He forgives his brothers. And as a result, Joseph opens up a whole new possibility for his family, enabling them to survive despite the heavy odds against them and enabling them someday to become the nation that God calls into existence. In our day, there are peoples in the world who have experienced such cycles of violence and long-standing conflicts that we find it hard to believe in the possibility of any new future for them. And yet we know it can happen. In a speech given to a joint session of the U.S. Congress in February of 1990, just two months after he was elected president of Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel, spoke of the extraordinary times in which Central and Eastern Europeans found themselves. He spoke of one of the most dramatic revolutionary changes in the political structure of the world during the 20th century. Who would have thought that the parliament inherited from the totalitarian regime that had imprisoned Václav Havel would have elected him candidate for the office of presidency? Here are his words. We are living in extraordinary times. The human face of the world is changing so rapidly that none of the familiar political indicators are adequate. We playwrights who have to cram a lifetime or an entire historical era into a two hour play can scarcely understand this rapidity ourselves. And it give, and if it gives us trouble, think of the trouble it must give to political scientists who spend their whole lives studying the realm of the probable and have even less experience with the realm of the improbable than playwrights do. Havel, a playwright who by some unexpected twist of events became president, 
could hardly digest the new reality that faced him and his fellow countrymen, a reality in which what they thought were impossibilities just a moment before became possibilities that even artists could not have imagined. Last November at the Parliament of the World's Religions, I witnessed a peace award being given to Dr. Isildin Abuelish. It was there that I was first introduced to his story. Dr. Abuelish was born in a Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza in 1955. It was there that he grew up, and through constant hard work and hope for a better future, he became a doctor. Overcoming many challenges along the way, he went to medical school in Cairo, studied obstetrics and gynecology in Saudi Arabia, completed a residency at Soroka Hospital in Israel. He then studied fetal medicine and genetics at hospitals in Milan, Italy, and Brussels, Belgium. And when he realized that if he wanted to make a larger difference for the Palestinian people, he would need management and policy-making skills, he enrolled in a master's program in public health at Harvard University. Throughout his adult life, he straddled living in Gaza and studying and working outside of Palestine. The strife of Gaza has been the backdrop of his and his family's whole lives. On January 16, 2009, when an Israeli rocket was fired into Gaza, it landed in his girl's bedroom. And upon impact, his three daughters and their cousin were killed. As you can imagine, in the immediate aftermath, a chorus of people called for Israeli blood to atone for the deaths of his daughters and niece. Dr. Abulesh has written a response to such calls for revenge in his book entitled, I Shall Not Hate. When asked by persons, don't you hate the Israelis? He wonders, which Israelis am I supposed to hate? The doctors and nurses I work with? The babies I have delivered? What about the soldier, the soldier who fired the deadly volleys from the tank? Didn't you hate them? As for the soldier who shelled my house, I believe, in his I believe that in his conscience he has already punished himself, that he is asking himself, what have I done? And even if he doesn't think that now, tomorrow, when he's a father, he will. He will suffer for his actions when he sees how precious is the life of his child. One never knows how such tragedies will play out in the personal lives of all the people involved. One never knows how it will play out in the life of a whole nation. But Dr. Abu Alesh remains open to the possibility of salvation for both Palestinians and Israelis. Though he struggles to understand how a coexistence between Palestinians and Israelis will finally come about, he knows for certain that it will be possible only by a refusal to hate. Hatred and violence can only perpetuate the cycles of violence of the past. If they want a future different from their past, they will have to refuse to hate. Let us remember how the story of Joseph ends, for it is a remarkable ending. Joseph forgave his brothers. Despite their treachery and violence against him, he forgave them. Forgiveness came with such intensity of emotional effort that when Joseph forgave them, he and his brothers felt such anguish and wept so loudly that the Egyptians and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Some philosophers may be concerned that when we consider our lives to be part of some providential plan of God, we may, we may make no room for our own freedom and agency. Could it be instead that there is no greater freedom from past ills, from the self-perpetuating cycles of violence and retribution of the past, 
than the freedom to refuse to hate and the freedom to forgive. Could it be that God has given us the power to forgive and that forgiveness is the cardinal manifestation of God's providence at work? Could it be that forgiveness is the most powerful providential reordering of the world? Without erasing the wrongs that happen in human affairs, could it be that forgiveness is what makes possible the creation of something new, a new heart, a new people, a new nation, a new order? Amen.